We already know that if you see dysmorphic red blood cells described on microscopic urinalysis, you should suspect a glomerular pathology. Next, we'll discuss some specific glomerular diseases and their nephritic and nephrotic presentations. Let's start by discussing some key differences between tubular and glomerular diseases. Whereas tubular disease is typically acute in its presentation, glomerular diseases are typically more insidious. Tubular diseases are typically caused by toxins or hypoperfusion, whereas glomerular diseases are usually immune-mediated. Tubular diseases typically don't present with a nephrotic picture, but all glomerular diseases can cause nephrotic syndrome. Whereas tubular disease typically doesn't need a biopsy to make the diagnosis, almost all glomerular diseases need a biopsy to confirm their cause. Tubular disease typically doesn't need steroids or immune suppressives, but since glomerular diseases are usually immune mediated, steroids, cyclophosphamide, or mycophenolate are the mainstays of treatment. The kidney has two main jobs. The first is to filter, and the second is to reabsorb electrolytes and nutrients and secrete toxins and wastes. Tubular diseases lead to abnormalities of reabsorption and secretion, where glomerular diseases lead to problems with losing substances in the urine that are usually filtered out back into the bloodstream. There are few common findings that are present in all forms of glomerular disease. The first is hematuria. It's present because the glomeruli usually provide the filtration mechanism that keep red blood cells out of the urine. Those red blood cells are dysmorphic because they're squeezed through the abnormal glomeruli. They can also form red blood cell casts as they clog up the tubular system and are subsequently flushed out into the urine. The urine sodium and the fractional excretionals of sodium are both low because the tubular mechanism to absorb electrolytes works just fine. It's the filtration system here that's abnormal. Proteinuria is present as well due to the abnormal filtration. All glomerular diseases have these same basic findings. Uh, we'll discuss in subsequent slides how differences between the glomerular diseases can be used to make the diagnosis. One of these characteristics is the amount of proteinuria, whereas nephritic and nephrotic syndrome both have protein in the urine. It's the degree of proteinuria that helps us tell the difference between the two. One glomerular disease that's often tested on the USMLE Step 2 is Goodpasture syndrome. You'll want to think about the diagnosis of Goodpasture syndrome when you see the signs and symptoms of glomerular disease plus lung involvement. One thing to remember is that in Goodpasture syndrome, there's no involvement of the upper respiratory tract. This is what helps us differentiate it from Wegener's granulomatosis that can also present with hematuria and hemoptysis, but will also have upper respiratory tract like sinus disease as well. The important thing about good pasture is that only the lung and kidney are involved. There's no skin, joint, GI, or neurologic involvement. This also helps you differentiate good pastures from other vasculitic processes. Now to make the diagnosis of good pastures, the best initial test is to look for antiglomerular basement membrane antibodies. These are antibodies that target type 4 collagen. The most accurate test, however, is to actually get a piece of tissue and perform immunofluorescence on that tissue. The biopsy can either be in the lung or the kidney. You'll see the same linear deposits uh, in either lung or kidney tissue if you perform immunofluorescence and those linear deposits happen because of a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. Here's a slide from a renal biopsy performed on a patient with Goodpasture syndrome. On regular light microscopy, what you'll notice is the formation of crescents in greater than 50% of the glomeruli. Here are some clinical pearls in making the diagnosis of Goodpasture syndrome either in real life or on the USMLE Step 2. Patients often present with anemia from chronic blood loss due to the hemoptysis. The chest x-ray is often abnormal, but chest x-ray findings alone are not diagnostic. Because the pathophysiology is antibody-mediated, plasmapheresis can help acutely in uh, the treatment of Goodpasture syndrome. 
However, the effect is only temporary because it only removes the antibodies that are already circulating. Steroids and cyclophosphamide can help suppress the immune system and keep more autoantibodies from being made. IgA nephropathy, also known as Berger disease, is the most common cause of glomerular nephritis. Unfortunately, its presentation is a bit nonspecific, which makes it difficult to pick out in a clinical vignette. Typically though, the question stem will describe a patient with intermittent hematuria, and this person had a respiratory tract infection one to two days previously. A common wrong answer choice to this question will typically be post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. And these two are easy to confuse because in both cases, a patient is sick and then sometime later, they have hematuria. The key difference is the timing between the onset of illness symptoms and the hematuria itself. In Berger disease, the timing between illness and hematuria is one to two days. In post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis, the interval is one to three weeks between the strep throat or impetigo and the hematuria. So these are important things to keep in mind. Additionally, other lab findings might be present. For example, Serum IgA levels are increased in about 50% of cases, but the most accurate test is to actually observe IgA deposition in the mesangium of glomeruli on kidney biopsy. There's no proven treatment for Berger disease. Half of cases are gonna spontaneously resolve, and the other half, unfortunately, will ultimately progress to end-stage renal disease requiring dialysis. In patients in whom the protein loss is very severe, ACE inhibitors and steroids may slow down protein loss and help with symptoms of edema and hypertension, but it's important to remember that these treatments will not either slow down or stop the actual disease process itself. We already spoke about how post-infectious glomerular nephritis can be confused with IgA nephropathy, so let's go into a little bit more detail about post-infectious glomerular nephritis itself. The most common infection to cause a post-infectious glomerular nephritis is streptococcus. Typically, the hematuria follows a throat infection or a skin infection, impetigo, by one to three weeks. The presentation is hematuria, which manifests as Coca-Cola colored urine, edema, particularly around the eyes, hypertension, and oliguria, or low urine output. Here's a picture of the exudative pharyngitis consistent with a group A strep infection that may precede hematuria by one to three weeks in a patient with post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. When making the diagnosis of post-infectious glomerular nephritis, there are three main diagnostic tests to know. The best first test is just a urinalysis this will confirm that the patient does indeed have glomerular nephritis. What will you see on the urinalysis? Well, you'll see the dysmorphic red blood cells, the red blood cell cast, and the proteinuria that are characteristic of all glomerular nephritides. The second test to perform is an ASO titer, anti-streptolysin O, or an anti-DNase antibody titer to prove that the etiology of the glomerular nephritis is indeed post-streptococcal. Again, the most accurate test in determining the etiology of any nephrotic or nephritic syndrome is going to be a kidney biopsy. This will show us once and for all what the etiology is. Typically, we don't do a kidney biopsy in patients in whom we suspect post-infectious glomerular nephritis because these blood tests for ASO and anti-DNase are sufficiently accurate and usually the disorder res resolves spontaneously. So we wouldn't want to put a patient through an unnecessary invasive procedure in this case. Another lab test that can be helpful but is not diagnostic is to look at serum complement levels. Serum complement levels can be low in post-infectious glomerular nephritis, but they're also low in any immune complex mediated disease, uh, such as lupus nephritis that we'll talk about later. Here we see a slide from a kidney biopsy from a patient with post-infectious glomerular nephritis. 
What you notice about the glomeruli is that they're hypercellular as the immune complexes that deposit recruit other inflammatory cells. You can also see the formation of crescents within Bowman's capsule. It's important to note that the treatment of the offending bacteria will not reverse the glomerular nephritis. And treating strep throat with amoxicillin, for example, will not prevent post-strep glomerular nephritis from occurring. Remember, we treat strep with amoxicillin or with another penicillin to prevent the development of rheumatic fever, not glomerular nephritis. Treatment of post-infectious glomerular nephritis is mainly supportive. You can use antibiotics to treat the symptoms of the infection itself. You can use diuretics to control hypovolemia and symptoms of volume overload. Uh, but luckily, the prognosis is pretty good for post-infectious glomerular nephritis. Only 5% or less of cases go on to progress to renal failure. Alport syndrome is a rare but commonly tested form of glomerular pathology. It results from a congenital defect of type 4 collagen, the same type of collagen that has antibodies directed against it uh, in good pasture syndrome. You should think about Alport syndrome when you have a patient with symptoms of glomerular disease combined with two other key findings. Those findings are sensory neural hearing loss and visual disturbances that are caused by a loss of collagen fibers that hold the lens of the eye in place. Now since this disease is congenital, there's no specific treatment. There's really nothing that can be done to reverse the defect in type 4 collagen. Polyarteritis nodosa is a systemic vasculitis of small and medium-sized arteries, and it can affect nearly every organ in the body. However, you can distinguish polyarteritis from other diseases like Good Pastures or Wegener's by its characteristic lack of lung findings. Its etiology is unknown, but there is an association with hepatitis B. So, if a clinical vignette describes a case of polyarteritis nodosa and then asks you what the most appropriate health screening test is, the correct answer in that case would be to look for hepatitis B surface antigen. Since the renal symptoms in polyarteritis nodosa are similar to all other forms of glomerular nephritis, including hematuria, hypertension, edema, the way to make the diagnosis of polyarteritis nodosa is to look for findings in other organ systems. In the GI system, abdominal pain is present and is usually worse after eating. This is due to the vasculitic process in the mesenteric arteries can also see GI bleeding, nausea, and vomiting. In the neurologic system, you typically see neuropathy because the blood vessels feeding the peripheral nerves can also be affected by the vasculitis. This leads to ischemic injury. The mononeuritis multiplex is when one large peripheral nerve, like the perineal, brachial, or radial, is affected by itself. Up to one-third of patients will have skin involvement, and types of skin involvement include petechiae, purpura, ulcers, or livido reticularis. This is due to the vasculitis leading to skin ischemia. Finally, cardiac involvement can be present also, and you'll want to think about polyarteritis nodosa, particularly if stroke or MI happens in a young person. When making the diagnosis of polyarteritis nodosa, Blood tests are going to show anemia and leukocytosis because of blood loss and the immune system reacting against the process, an elevated ESR and C reactive protein showing a general degree of whole body inflammation. ANCA is typically not present in most cases of polyarteritis nodosa. This helps us to distinguish it from other forms of vasculitis. ANA and rheumatic factor Sometimes these are present, but typically it's a low titer, and again, ANA and RF can be present in a lot of other autoimmune processes as well. Findings on angiography can be a little bit more helpful. Sometimes they'll perform angiography on either the renal arteries, mesenteric arteries, or hepatic artery, and can show aneurysmal dilatation due to the vasculitis. Finally, as has been the trend, biopsy is the most accurate test particularly if you perform the biopsy at a symptomatic site.
As far as treatment is concerned, prednisone and cyclophosphamide have been shown to reduce mortality in patients with polyarteritis nodosa. If the patient does have hepatitis B, treating the hepatitis B has been found to show benefit as well. You may remember from the USMLE Step 1 that you had to memorize the five classes of lupus nephritis and how to identify them by pathologic specimen. Luckily for Step 2, you do not need to remember that level of detail. All you need to know is that lupus can give you both a nephrotic or a nephritic presentation, and it can actually give you any degree of renal involvement. Presentations range from a totally normal kidney biopsy to mild asymptomatic proteinuria, to a membranous glomerular nephritis, to glomerular sclerosis, which is a scarring process without inflammation that leads to end-stage renal disease and ultimately requiring dialysis. In a patient with lupus and renal involvement, you really do need to get a biopsy. It tells you both how severe the disease is and, in turn, helps you choose the best therapy for that patient. In cases of mild disease, really you just need steroids, but if the disease is more extensive, you'll want to choose a stronger immunosuppressive therapy like cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate. Amyloidosis is another cause of glomerular disease. Remember that amyloid is an abnormal protein that's produced in association with several systemic diseases. The most common is multiple myeloma, but it's also produced in the setting of chronic inflammatory diseases, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and chronic infections. Amyloid, as well as some other kidney pathologies like HIV nephropathy, polycystic kidneys, and diabetic nephropathy, give a characteristic finding of large kidneys on sonogram and CT scan. Like with all glomerular diseases, the most accurate test for amyloidosis is a biopsy. The characteristic findings are apple green birefringence and Congo red staining. The best treatment for amyloidosis is to control the underlying disease. Second line treatment, sometimes helpful, includes melphalan and prednisone therapy. In this slide, from a renal biopsy in a patient with amyloidosis, we see the characteristic apple green birefringence seen with Congo red stain. We've discussed a lot of glomerular diseases and we've thrown out words like nephritic and nephrotic, so let's go ahead and define what we actually mean when we say nephrotic syndrome. When something's described as nephrotic, all they're really saying is that it's reached a threshold of protein lost in the urine per day. Nephrotic range proteinuria can be found in association with any form of glomerular disease, so it's by no means specific to anything in particular. The number that you'll want to memorize for USMLE Step 2 is the number 3.5. If you lose more than 3.5 grams of protein in a 24-hour period of urine collection, you've reached the threshold of nephrotic range proteinuria. At this rate of urinary protein loss, the liver really can't keep up anymore. The liver just isn't able to increase the production of albumin fast enough to compensate for this degree of urinary loss. The loss of that much albumin is what leads to the characteristic symptoms of nephrotic syndrome. Those symptoms include edema, particularly around the eyes, hyperlipidemia, and a prothrombotic state. The prothrombotic state is brought on by urinary losses of protein C, protein S, and antithrombin. The most common causes of nephrotic syndrome are also pretty common diseases in the population. Those are diabetes and hypertension. Ultimately though, any of the glomerular diseases we described earlier in this lecture can lead to nephrotic range proteinuria. There are some specific associations you should know for USMLE Step 2. The first is that cancer of any solid organ predisposes you to membranous glomerular nephritis. Children with nephrotic syndrome most commonly have minimal change disease. If a patient is described in the clinical vignette as an injection drug user or is HIV positive, you'll want to think about focal segmental glomerular sclerosis.
People with a history of heavy NSAID use can also have minimal change disease. They're also more likely to have membranous glomerular nephritis. And as we said before, patients with lupus, anything goes. They can have any manifestation of nephrotic or nephritic syndrome. If you're presented with a patient in whom you suspect nephrotic syndrome, the best initial test is always urinalysis. What urinalysis will do for you is it will confirm the proteinuria, and if you look at the protein under the microscope, you may see something called a Maltese cross. This is where there are lipid deposits in sloughed off tubular cells. The next best test is to obtain either an albumin creatinine ratio or a 24 hour urine protein collection. Either of these will quantify how much protein is being lost in the urine. Remember our cutoff, if it's greater than 3.5 grams in 24 hours, and that corresponds to an albumin creatinine ratio of 3.5 to 1 or greater, that's diagnostic of nephrotic syndrome. Also, remember from earlier that these two tests are absolutely equal in their accuracy. And if you have to choose one over the other, it's much easier to get a spot albumin creatinine ratio than collect every drop of a patient's urine for a, a full 24 hours. Again, I sound like a broken record, but the most accurate test in figuring out the etiology of nephrotic syndrome is going to be a renal biopsy. It'll tell you whether or not the nephrotic syndrome is caused by focal segmental disease, membranous disease, membranoproliferative disease, minimal change disease, or mesangial disease. On step one, you had to memorize the pathologic differences between these different forms of nephrotic syndrome, but luckily on step two, you just need to know that you need a biopsy to tell the differences between them. To review, the findings diagnostic for nephrotic syndrome are the same, regardless of etiology. These findings include hyperproteinuria, which means protein in the urine that's greater than 3.5 grams per 24 hours, hypoproteinemia, less protein or albumin in the blood because more of it is being lost in the urine, hyperlipidemia, and edema, particularly periorbital edema. Just like the presenting symptoms of nephrotic syndrome can be the same regardless of the underlying etiology, Treatment of nephrotic syndrome is also the same, regardless of what caused the nephrotic syndrome in the first place. The mainstay of treatment is going to be immune suppression with glucocorticoids. This can either be prednisone or prednisolone. For frequent relapses of nephrotic syndrome, the second line treatment is further immune suppression with something like cyclophosphamide. Now other than that, the treatment options are limited to really controlling the symptoms associated with nephrotic syndrome. For protein loss, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers can help decrease the amount of protein lost in the urine and the problems that stem from that. Edema can be managed by dietary changes such as salt restriction and also with the use of diuretics. And finally, hyperlipidemia associated with nephrotic syndrome is treated the same way we treat hyperlipidemia in any other patient. We use statins or other anti-cholesterol drugs to help control the lipids in the blood. And that concludes this section.